Hey guys, and welcome back to Crohn's Cast Live on Facebook. Today we're sitting down with Crohn's mummy, and if you've never met her before, she's a fantastic, beautiful woman who has been through a whole lot uh, with her IBD Crohn's, and we're going to get stuck into it today. So without further ado, I'll bring in Yvonne, aka Crohn's mummy. And if you just get uh, the people at home a bit of an introduction about yourself, like um, who you are, where you are, and what's going on in your life at the minute. Okay, so I'm Yvonne Holly, and I'm also known as Crohn's Mummy on Instagram. Um, I'm 30 years old, and I have had Crohn's disease since the age of 12, so for 18 years. And... Um, I am a mummy to two little girls, and I'm married, and I live um, and come from Somerset. Um, do you want me to step in and just start talking about my journey, Johnny? Yeah. So, um, if you could just let us know what, when were you diagnosed, and how was that done for you? What, like, what were you going through at the time? Okay. So. When I first started getting symptoms, I was around about 11 years old and um, anything that I would put into my mouth, um, I would literally run to the toilet and um, I would have no control over my bowels and my mum picked up on it and took me to the doctors at a very and um the doctors had no clue what was wrong with me back then they didn't really know um didn't have much like knowledge brains and colitis so i was taken to bristol children's hospital and they went in and investigated with some cameras um, and um i remember coming round and the surgeon saying that basically um i was so um, severe um, with my Crohn's disease that I was diagnosed with Crohn's colitis on the spot, which is a very severe form of Crohn's disease. And from then on, I was just put on steroids. I was put on a drug called Mufotrexate. I tried all the drug called um, Infliximax. Um, I yeah, literally tried everything going, I was tube fed, I wasn't allowed to eat, um, I was very, very poorly, I was three and a half stone, if that, at 12 years old, and um, yeah, it was just, it was horrible for me as a child just to go through something like that, it was just really horrible, it wasn't nice at all. How did you cope with school and things? Um, so I missed the whole year eight, so that would be when I was 12, 13, yeah. So I missed the whole year of school, and I went to a school in Bristol, Children's Bristol Hospital. Um, and then eventually, when they got me under control for a little bit, um, I was allowed to go back to school, but nobody recognised me because I was pumped full of steroids. And I come back, I, I, you know, I left year seven skinny as a rake and white as a ghost because I was so poorly and come back with these massive clamps for cheeks because I was on steroids and it, people were like oh who's the new girl and I was like no it's me <laughs> you know so but everyone actually at school um my whole form were actually really understanding and were really amazing and made it good for me and made it easy for me so in that respect, I had it quite easy with school, to be honest with you. Even though I was embarrassed because I was thinking, oh my God, where's the toilet? I'm going to poo myself, blah, 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 because that's what you do with Crohn's disease. Anytime you eat anything. But no, all my friends were just like, it's all right, so what? Like, you know, they just, they were brilliant. And they always have been ever since. So school was mm -hmm. okay when I was there. But and when I was poorly, um, my teachers were like, don't come in the lesson. I had a, a, my own little room where I could just go and sit. There's a little sofa in there and a jug of water and stuff. And I could just sit there and I didn't have to go and take part in the lesson if I didn't feel well because I'd only be um, running from that lesson 10 times because I needed to go to the toilet. So they'd be like, Yvonne, look, just go and sit in the room if you keep needing to go to the toilet. And yeah, so I was really supported 
and I had a nurse at the school as well that had obviously educated all the member of staff at school about me. So yeah, I was really supported really well at school with teachers and all my friends and all the people. So yeah, it, it the school was not a worry for me. Um, no, it was okay. It was okay. That's amazing because uh, like at so at that age, obviously a lot of things happen. There's a lot of peer pressure. Yeah. And p- kids can be really mean, so it's actually um, um, quite amazing yeah. to hear how positive your experience has been. How, uh, like, how much your school actually supported you in terms of the teachers and setting things up for you? That's 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 a wonderful experience to have. Yes, um, school was amazing, really good. So, what most people may know you for um, is your social media account at the minute. Um, yeah. And that's how we we sort of got introduced uh, through through friends on social media, and then we joined a, a collaborative group together, and then we got we got chat, and then today we end up on a live broadcast. Um, but so, how did you end up with social media, and what was your reasons for sort of launching yourself as Crohn's Mummy? Um, so obviously, when I left school and everything, um, I become really poorly again, and I ended up um, needing a colostomy bag. Um, being very poorly with sepsis, then needing another cosmi bag, a permanent one. Then obviously my bum removed. Um, but it wasn't till I, after my first child, so I had my first child when I was about twenty three, and it wasn't till like a few years, a couple of years after that, just before I had my bum removed, that I started going on social media because. I saw a lady on um, the TV with her bag out, and, and don't get me wrong, I'd always done that, I'd always walked on the beach with my bag out, but I hadn't ever thought to do it on social media, I just um, thought, you know, I don't need to go on social media and get sympathy, I wanted to keep that personal with all my friends and family, I thought, but then I realised that this other lady that had gone on social media, she had helped thousands of people, and I realised that she had helped me, but I thought, actually, no, if I go on social media, I'm going to follow what this lady's doing, and I'm going to help, you know, thousands of people like she did, like she helped me, so... I thought I need to get on um, Instagram. I love just, just you know, I really liked Instagram. It's my favorite. I don't really use anything else. Use Facebook. Um, so I got onto um, Instagram and I was like, gonna call myself Instagram because I have brains and I'm also a mummy. And obviously, people will be able to think, oh, she's got brains. That's good. Oh, and she's a mum. And a lot of ladies worry about having children with their cranes and with a question bag. So I thought, you know, that's a lot of reassurance that people will see that name and will reach out to me and the rest is history because I lost count of the amount of people that reached out to me um on social media and whether they're mummies or not mummies and I've managed to help them and I will never stop doing that now because there have been dark times when people have said, look I've even, I've even after I went through all of this, and then they've seen my page and spoke to me for an hour, and actually I've turned their life around. They're like, I'm having the surgery, you know. Thank you so much. I put them in a better mental state, just by me having this Instagram page. So that is why I have Instagram. That's amazing. So you actually have uh, frequent live interactions with people on your page. Yes. I think that's that's really special because, like, you know, a lot of uh, social media is literally just posting stuff and it goes on there, it gets a few likes or a couple of comments. But to actually encourage live interaction like you're doing and having that positive relationship with people, it's, it's so important. And that's exactly what I think we're all trying to do with regards to advocacy and reach out. But I think you do it so well. Um, it's really admirable and, like, I think you as a person as well, you've got such an approachable nature about you. That could be your mother and instinct, I don't know, but yeah, it's just like, you know, you you're very disarming as a person, which is which is lovely. Oh, um, you. <laughs> you mentioned obviously you've had several surgeries. And um, when did you actually get your first surgery? I say several, that's an understatement, but Okay, so I had my first surgery when I was about 
Okay, so um, my first ever surgery was when I was about 17. So even though I got diagnosed at 12, and I was put to sleep a lot because of uh, like colonoscopies and things like that, but my, my first ever surgery when I was about 17, mm -hmm. and that was when my Crohn's came fighting back with a massive horseshoe abscess in my bum and they went in to remove this horseshoe abscess and um, put it this way nine years after going in first going in i was still left with this horseshoe perianal abscess so um yeah so i was having an operation every two to three months for nine years on a perianal abscess in my bum um, and in the meantime I had um, a perforated bowel, I had a, a loop clostomy, an end clostomy, I had bowel removed on three occasions and I still had this perianal abscess. Now you're going to think why didn't you just like have your bum removed and the reason for that is because this is me not everybody else where my horseshoe abscess was and where it'd been there for so long, if they removed that, they would then be given, be taken away the child and me being able to have children. So they kept this abscess inside me just so I could have children, basically. Um, so I managed to have both of my children with this abscess and I had operations with this abscess inside of me while I was pregnant and, um, and when I was pregnant I can remember my first pregnancy, oh wow, I felt absolutely amazing, the best I've ever felt all my life and, um, and then basically they just, they kept saying to me, look, you, you haven't even had an operation, it's like been like five months and normally I was having one like every two to three months. I so say my first pregnancy was amazing, but then after that, she came and I ended up having a big operation. And then I ended up having the operations again every two to three months. And then it got to the point when they were like, look, if you're going to have another child, we're going to need to do it quick because we need to re remove this abscess. Making you poorly, you guys. You're being poorly just so you can have another child. So I, I said, right, okay. And all, the, all this planning around children was never just about me. It was about my surgeon planning me and my husband to have a baby, which is crazy because... That's, that's a, such a big deal though as well, isn't it? Yeah. And why, why is it, um, so for any of the, the ladies watching, which seems to be quite a few in the chat, um, all of them very positive about you and um, all the things you do. But what is it about... Um, Having your Barbie butt that stops you from being able to have children and things like I'm not. What is that danger okay. there? So it's not the Barbie butt, but there is a slight ah, okay. risk. There is a slight risk with the Barbie butt. But before I continue, I have Crohn's colitis, perianal abscess Crohn. So I everybody's different. So you can have the Barbie butt and still have children. Of course you can. But I had this perianal horseshoe abscess in my bum for nine years that caused sepsis, that caused leaked and trapped fistulas for nine years. And this abscess was near my fallopian tubes. So mm. this is me. This is not everybody else with Crohn's disease. So I don't want any other ladies to worry out there. Um, so yeah, so they said when they remove the abscess, it's going to be quite a high chance that there'd be quite a few complications and I might not be able to have children again. But there is a small risk when you actually have your bum removed without the abscess that it can affect your reproductive system. But there's not much, um, what would you call it? There's not much awareness or, um, what do you call it when, um, or information about it. There's not much information about it on that side of things with the reproductive system because um, actually having, since having my bum removed, my reproductive system has been um, not very good. Um, but going back to where we were, 
when I had my abscess removed, it was very um, close to my fallopian tubes. So when they did remove the abscess, there was a high risk that I wouldn't be able to have children. So I made sure I had both my children. And then I remember getting sepsis and I was really poorly. And they removed my um, abscess and they removed my whole bum. And also I had plastic surgery done because of the the how how intense the abscess had caused damage in my bum. Um, so I not only had my bum removed, but I had a bum removal, I had an abscess removal near my reproductive system, and I also had my bum lifted and plastic surgery to build up my wall inside near my vagina and near my back of my bum because of where the abscess had been for nine years. Wow, I mean, that's like some serious work going into that. Um, and your relationship with your surgeon is exceptionally unusual as well, I believe, isn't it? You've been with the same surgeon for the whole time. The same surgeon, and, and to be honest with you, I probably would have picked off, picked, picked off big time if I hadn't, the, if he had gone or just, you know, because he literally was from the start. He's been through this whole journey with me. He's done 57 procedures on me. So he's gone inside my body 57 times and I'm still alive. He saved me from sepsis three times. I'm still alive. So basically, yeah, if another surgeon wanted to touch me, I would be, I would make sure that they were trained under this surgeon that I've had because I basically, I do. I trust my life with him. I have many of times. I would not be here if, if it wasn't for him. So, yeah, I have an absolutely extraordinary relationship with my surgeon. He was incredible. So with, with your pregnancy, how did you find it? Because I know um, there's three channels that can happen when you've got IBD. It can get worse or it can go into remission or it can stay exactly the same. I'm just wondering, like, was you've had a couple of, you've had two girls, is it? I've had two girls, yes. Yeah, so the, I was just wondering, like, was there a difference between pregnancies for you? And, like, how was it emotionally for you, um, the process of getting pregnant, carrying the baby to term, and things? What was that like? Okay, yeah, so, um, like any lady that have been on immune compromised drugs, you worry, am I going to get pregnant? My surgeon was like, right, just go for it. If you don't, we'll help you, Ron, behind you, IVF. You'll get it free of charge. I had the, I can remember my surgeon taking my implant out when I was asleep having one of my abscess surgeries. I remember waking up and him saying, right, good luck, go home, get pregnant, because he took my implant out, my <laughs> implant out. So then I went home and I was like, right, this is it now. Like, I wonder how long it's going to take. It took, I had a period and I was pregnant and I still to this day think, wow, I am incredibly lucky. And so, yeah, I was pregnant straight away and my surgeon was just like, wow, Yvonne, this is absolutely incredible. Mm. And then, um, yeah, I, I, my first pregnancy with Gordon, so is now seven now, sent me into remission, which I'm so happy to say, to the point where I never ever, since the age of 12, felt that healthy and felt energy and felt so good in my life. To the point where, like, most ladies get pregnant and they're like, oh, I can't go for a run anymore, or, oh, God, walking up this the steps where me I was the opposite I was like let's go out for a run let's walk up the let's do this let's do that because I just felt absolutely great and I was like what's happening to me to the doctor was like I'm pregnant but I was really poorly I've still got this abscess in my bum I was really poorly having an operation every two three months and now I'm great and they were like this is just work of God like work of magic but we can't we don't know I was like well can I be pregnant all the time without actually being pregnant? You know? But yeah, I felt amazing and I was looked after so well to the point that I had a scan every two to three weeks to check my baby for reassurance because obviously it was a colostomy bag. Oh, and another amazing thing, being pregnant with a colostomy bag, is you know, don't have to worry one bit. So when you're normally pregnant, your baby grows out the front 
and your bowels are behind. But when my baby, my little autumn, was growing, my bowel went around her. So it was like my <sighs> bowel was like cuddling her. So, and, but your body naturally just adapts and it's okay. And you're being so closely monitored all the time. You don't have to worry because they're showing your baby every two to three weeks on the scan. They're taking my bloods every two weeks because of the meds I'm on anyway. And, and yeah, and also I forgot to say, I did have to come off a drug called Humira, which was an injection I was taking every two weeks. And they had to because there wasn't enough evidence um, and they said that there could be complications with the pregnancies um, with the baby. So I had to go on a drug called azopiathin, which on the packet it will state, do not get pregnant on azopiathin, do not breastfeed. But there's enough evidence that it's okay to. So my doctors put me on that and yeah, it was absolutely fine. And the only thing is with that is um, when my babies are born, um, because of the effect of the ACE piping and suppressing my immune system, I'm not allowed live vaccines. So when my babies are born, they can't have all their live vaccines until they stop breastfeeding off of me. I don't know why I just did the boob ham in here, sorry. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> sorry, that's me, anyone knows. Um, yeah, so, yeah, so they had to make sure that was, you know. But yeah, so my first pregnancy went smooth. And um, I had to have C-sections because of the abscess on, in my van and a few other complications. And they said, right, let's get her out for 39 weeks. Went in, went all smoothly, had a spinal block. They put an upper drawer in just in case, because obviously I've got a lot of previous scar tissue from previous surgeries in my belly. Cut me open, had her out. They were like, she's a girl. I was like, oh, amazing. So I didn't know. And she was healthy. They took me back to the room. They were like, breastfeed her. And I was like, oh my God, is that all right? Because of the meds. And I was like, oh yes, I remember it's okay, blah, blah. And they were like, you can just relax. She'll breastfeed fine. You just, you know, and I didn't have to do nothing. So we literally just got on and did everything. And I was just like, wow, like, this is easy. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was my first pregnancy. Um, and then after pregnancy went, I got very poorly again, and the, the abscess infection was awful. I was in hospital every two months, attached to drips, um, antibiotics intravenously. Um, the infection, I was so septic for so long. Um, cause people don't realise you get lots of different types of sepsis, and I had a type of septic in my bum for like an earlier year. And I was is in hospital and sent home, and I was septic for that long. It's absolutely crazy. It's had to keep going in and having um, intravenous antibiotics just to you know give me a bit of bit of a clean out, as if they call it. And then he would go in surgery, give my abscess a scoop out, change all my cetons um, where the abscess was draining out of me, and do that every two to three months. And then obviously. We moved on to my second pregnancy now. Do you want me to go on to my second pregnancy now? Well, with all, all this um, going on, like how, how difficult was it? Because you've literally got a newborn baby. Were you able to continue breastfeeding? Like, what was what was the care like you were able to provide for your child? And how, how did that make you feel if it was different to what you perceived was going to be normal? I'm not going to lie. It was effing hard. <laughs> really, really hard. And I was having operation, like I said, every two to three months in the hospital. But do you know what? I still managed to breastfeed. There were, obviously, when I was in hospital, I could have breastfeed, but I would pump before I went into hospital. I would have a freezer full of milk. My husband would then, you know, pour that out and give it to my baby in a bottle. Um, and that was hard because he would be at home saying, she's not taking the bottle, she wants you. And But he would, you know... He did everything and he was amazing. He got her on the bottle when I was in hospital. Um, if I was around and I'd come out of hospital, she could sense me. She would not get on that bottle. But if I wasn't around, she would take the bottle, but only for my husband. So I'm thankful, Lee, and thank you so much for that because he, he, did, he did wonders with that. So, yeah, that was really hard. But I did manage to keep my breast milk coming in. I was in hospital. I was so poorly and I was there because obviously you've got this breast milk coming in anyway and um, 
and I didn't I didn't want it to dry up and it was painful. When your boobs are full of milk, it's bloody painful. And I'm just there like I've got drips all in this arm, drips in this arm, and I'm just there with the medulla pump, like just the medulla pump just going for it, just going for it. And the nurses and doctors are in and out, they're like, Oh, sorry, and I'm like, No. I said, if you're just gonna come in, come in. I said, I do not care, like they're like, oh, that's all right then, as long as you don't mind, because they didn't care either. I was like, no, I said, look, I've got to do what I've got to do. And they're like, yeah, definitely. They're like, can't even believe you're still doing that. And don't get me wrong, a lot of nuns like me probably wouldn't have carried on, but there was something in me that just said, you've got to pump it out anyway. So just keep it going, Yvonne. Don't let it dry up. Just keep it going. And I did. I kept it going. And, yeah, it was tough. It was hard, but I look back and think I was really proud of myself and I kept my breast milk going for my baby. And yeah, so it was tricky times, but I got through it like you always do. You do. You're, you're put your face with something and people are like, how do you cope? You just do. You have to. You have no choice. Like, you just do, don't you? I don't think curling up in a ball. I'm not saying it's wrong to just curl up and ball and be ill, because that's okay, you can do that sometimes, but sometimes to be, you know, happy and positive, you just have to give yourself a massive punch in the back and be like, come on, you've got this, just crack on with it, come on, just keep doing it, because otherwise you will slip into depression, you will slip into a horrible dark place, and you do, but um, and it's, it's, it, it probably is easier for me to say, because I have my baby there thinking, got to do it for her, my husband, got to do it for her, all my family that love me, all my friends that love me, got to do it for them, but more importantly, I was like, got to do it for myself, but I did have a huge support network around me, and yes, that does help. I think that's amazing, and you're right, you know, there's, everyone's walking their own path, but I think for me, having gone through similar processes, I don't know if I could have uh, pumped my breast if I had breasts and a, and a child to pump for. Um, and that's okay. If yeah. You, know, you still a warrior. You still went through badass stuff, and that's okay. But everybody's different, and that's just how I dealt with it. And someone else might deal with it different, but we're both amazing, and we're both still warriors. We just everyone deals with things differently, and it's okay. How you deal with it is okay as long as up here you're all right. Do what you need to do. Yeah, and I think I just think like that you're in you're in a strength, like because you're you're a small lady, you know what I mean? But like your strength of depth, the character is just unbelievable, and the ability, like the strength of your mental strength, is something that is really admirable. And it's just like you do the most amazing job. Like womanhood is one of the most amazing jobs that exists in the world. Like. There isn't a person out there alive today that hasn't got a woman to thank for it. And that's, that's, that's a state of fact. It's a biological fact. Oh, yeah, Everyone definitely. that's alive. <laughs> and it's just... Every man should say things like this. <laughs> and that's, that's what I, I, I just think it's, it's amazing. And it's such an amazing process. And it's a fucking hard process. And to have done it and going through what you went through afterwards, having also had that high of pregnancy where you're in remission and feeling amazing to then immediately have this wonderful child born after nine months of waiting, to then nosedive into sepsis and flares and surgeries and be able to just hold that, holding that head up. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's an amazing thing to, to, to bear witness to. Mm-hmm. Well, and that's, so we want to talk about my next pregnancy. Um, that is a, that my first pregnancy and um, Katie and all that afterwards is nothing compared to my next story about my second pregnancy. That is just, this is insane. Do you want me to just dive in with it? Yeah, yeah. I'm sure everyone watching would be would love to hear like the second pregnancy because again, like like you just alluded to, it, it sounds like it was very different to your first experience. To start off with, it wasn't. It was exactly the same. I I can remember I got all the MED again and I was like, oh, this is amazing. It's going to be the same as last time. And I was like to my husband, like, oh, why can't I be pregnant all the time? I feel great again. And 
I can remember I was, everything was fine and I was being looked after really well like last time and I was having a scan done every two to three weeks. I can remember I got to about, I think it was about 30 weeks pregnant and I can remember feeling dread through my whole body. Like, I, oh, I had to have two surgeries as well while I was pregnant with her because I my abscess kept flaring up so, and that was not nice. I, um, They said, look, you can be put to sleep, but if you're awake, there's less risk on the baby. And I was like, I'll be awake. The less risk on the baby, I'll always take that option. So they sedated me and they said, look, we don't normally do this operation awake because they put me up on stilts and they go in my bum, they cut my bum open and they scrape. And when I mean scrape, they scrape with a knife the outside, the inside of my bum where the abscess is. And then they will burst the abscess and they will just drain as much as possible of that as best they can, what, where they can get to without harming my teeth and things. And um, yeah, so they were doing that with me awake. Mm. But luckily enough, I was sedated so much that I couldn't really remember much, to be honest with you. So that was really good. And I also, my best friend, she's a nurse, her mum came in with me, she's um, a colorectal nurse, and she came in with me and, God, I love her so much, she helped me so much. Anyway, so, I remember getting to about 30 weeks, and I, I just wasn't right, I went for a scan, and they said, look, you're on, and I just knew it was coming, I didn't feel well. She's not, she hasn't been growing as much as she was in the beginning and the mid middle of your pregnancy. We'll leave you a couple of weeks and see how you get on. And then I started getting pain in my bowels. Went to see my consultant and they were like, yeah, you've got bad obstruction, um, like a bowel blockage. And so I was like, great. So now I had a bowel blockage. But you can get this without being pregnant. It doesn't mean I got it because I was pregnant. And amount of times I've had bowel blockages without being pregnant. Wow. Um, but yeah, so they were like, you've got a bowel blockage. And at this point, I was like, 33 weeks pregnant. And I was like, oh, okay. And then we went for another scan. And they're like, let's get out while we've gone. And, and, and when I went for another scan, I was 34 plus three days or something like that. And they're so like, do you know what? It's Friday afternoon. Let's give you two steroid injections to bring on her lungs now. And then tomorrow, let's give you two more steroid injections. And then next day, and then on Monday, we're going to take her out. And they're like, you're only 35 weeks pregnant. Most babies are completely healthy by then. And I'm like, yeah, but that's when their mum's healthy. I'm not healthy. They're like, yeah, we know that. And I was like, I've always been a positive person, but I just knew at the back of my mind something wasn't right. And they're like, she'll be fine, but we need to show you the neonatal ITU for babies. And I was like, okay. So this was just like a dream for me. I was walking into the tents of care and I was just like, is my baby going to be in here? Hopefully not. And they're like, no, no, it's a very small child. But something kept telling me, even though I'm really positive, something kept telling me she was going to be in there. Because you know your body, don't you? And I've always been right with my Crohn's disease. I've always known when I'm flaring or known when like the infection's really bad and my bum would be abscess and I go in and they're like, you're right. I knew when I had sepsis. They treated me for sepsis before they even got my blood cultured back. So anyway, I knew that something wasn't right. I just had this feeling like an aura in my head. Um, so I went in on the Monday and they said, oh, they got her out and they said, oh, wow, she was crying. So I was like, wow, she's crying. That's good. And they were like, wow, she weighs five pounds. I was like, what? Oh, that's amazing. And then um, all of a sudden, oh, it went quiet. And I was like, why is it so quiet? And Liam's like, I'm not really sure. He goes, you've got your colorectal surgeon looking at your bowel because obviously I had your bowel blockage. And then you've got about 10 people around baby. And I was like, Okay, but what's happening? I was saying to my husband, 
can you get going on? Just calm down. I said, can you just go and look at her? And he was like, I can't actually move. There's so many people in this theater, Yvonne. And they were actually performing bowel surgery on me, and I did not know, because I was so worried about my girl. They were actually, I had a twisted bowel. Uh, yeah, so they had to do the bowel surgery. Then they brought, brought my little girl over to me and said, oh, Yvonne, here we go, darling. Here's your little girl. Um, she decided to stop breathing, but she's okay now. And I'm like, but taking her and wanting to, you know, have her, but then at the same time, like, you, is this right? You're giving her to me? And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, the best place to be on mummy's skin. I was like, oh, yes, of course. So I put her on my skin. Next thing I know, she's blue, she's not breathing. And then they're running right down out the door. I, I just remember her, she was naked, and she, they put her on this, like, little, um, like trolley thing and they put like a mask sorry I'm a bit upset speaking about it. Compares do need to compare with this all right. Have we had a similar experience with our little boy last year and he was born he had sort of dyslocia as, as he was getting born so he came out blue and uh we didn't know what was going on either and it was it's a very scary experience. Yeah I mean um so they had ran down the hallway with her. They'd, you know, just finished stitching me up and stuff. And I had a spinal block. I had bowel surgery. I had a C-section. And all I wanted to do was be with my baby. And I wanted, I knew that she couldn't breathe. And all those steroid injections that they thought would help, but obviously hadn't helped bring on her lungs. And... I said, imagine, I need to get down there. And I, all, all they kept saying was, Yvonne, look, you, you're in a bad place too. You, you, you can't walk. I was like, look, I've had a lot of surgeries. I was like, what I've had done now is nothing compared to what I've had done in the past. I said, if someone doesn't get me in a wheelchair to see her, I am going to drag myself there. And the nurses could see that I meant business. My husband just looked at them like, she's stubborn, She been through a lot and they were just like right we've read your notes get in the wheelchair we'll take you down there and when I got down there I could understand why they didn't want me down there but they were like she's her mum's going to be able to cope she's been through a rough time of her life <coughs> and I walked in the room and um yeah was, she was just in this like little tank and it was a hot cot and um, she had so many tubes attached to her and her body was just, you know, like the machine, the ventilator was breathing for her and her body was just going <laughs> like this. And everything mm -hmm. I'd been through in life, it was, to me, that was just nothing then. It was just, I looked at her and was just like, oh my God, is this my fault? Um, oh my god, you know, like it was just so horrible. And at the moment, I started doing these podcasts. And um, to be honest with you, Tommy, I haven't really talked about it this much. And I haven't, I don't think I've really ever, ever got it out of my system. You know, I think this is a kind of, I do, I'm sorry I'm crying so much, but I'm not sorry, if not me. Oh God! But yeah, it was it was her. But, um, she got better, and she got better. And I can remember I was trying to pump my breast milk for her. I couldn't pump it because she wasn't next to me. She was in intensive care, and I was in another bed. And the hospital as well. They let me stay in hospital because I said I was not going home. I was in there for nearly three weeks, and um. The hospital were absolutely incredible to me. They really were. I could never, ever in my whole life felt the NHS. And, um, yeah, I can remember, like, trying to pump breast milk out, and I couldn't because I was so stressed about my baby. And I can remember, um, I, they, they had it, they were, they weren't, they didn't even feed her for the first three days. Poorly, and I was like, why is no one feeding my baby? I was like, I'm going to put a tube down to feed her. And they were like, she's too poorly to be fed, Yvonne, let alone. And I was like, oh, my God, like, what? 
like I didn't realize like, I knew she was poorly but you just don't realize how poorly they are and I just remember like I was trying to get nail cut out of my boobs and I was so stressed and I remember I was on the bed and I had the pump on and I was falling asleep I was like this and the pump was going and the pump makes that <laughs> funny noise and all of a sudden I could just hear like shh and I was like, oh my god, my breast milk's coming out. Oh my god, oh my god. And at this point, they had started to put the tube down to start feeding her. And they said, look, we're gonna, if we don't get no breast milk, we're going to just have to give her a bit of formula. And I was like, that's fine. And I can remember as soon as my breast milk came out, I had, a bo- I had one bottle and it was like bright yellow with phosphorus. And I was like, I just legged it down the corridor. Bear in mind, I had all these scars and all this surgery, and I was legged it. And I was like, I got breast milk for that. And they were like, Oh, how? Do you want, um, you know, like I could sit there and I could see them put the breast milk in her tube, and then they put this little dummy in her mouth. It was a see through dummy, so you can see her mouth through the dummy. So they were breastfeeding her through this NG tube for her nose mm-hmm. with my breast milk, and then the, she was sucking on a dummy, and she thought that she's like sucking from milk but she isn't she's got an end tube down and i was like this is the best invention ever and um i was just at that point i was just so happy she was getting me and my best milk inside of her and like people were saying but you were on morphine you were on tramadol you were on um IV antibiotics you know you were on all these drugs surely doesn't that affect your best milk and i'm like I have an amazing team around me that have taught me that with all the medication that I'm on, it's like dropping a meal of a, a meal of like alcohol in a swimming pool, and then that's how much it affects me. And then it has to go through my best breast milk, and it affects me even lesser again. So I was like, she's so getting breast milk, and the surgeons and all the nurses I knew were like, honestly, oh, on just. It's, it was completely fine to breastfeed her. And they were like, to be honest with you, for you to even breastfeed her, that would be amazing. We'd be so proud of you. And it would, you know, we can help other ladies that are poorly like you. So we can use you as an example that you can breastfeed on all these serious drugs and it doesn't affect your baby. And, you know, so yeah. And she was, she was in intensive care and for nearly, she was in that long time. And I can remember each day, we had a couple of stairs, she had some stomach bleeds and things when they aspirated but I can remember each day getting better and better and better and then when they get to like a certain stage they move them into the next room and the next room is like I kept seeing all these babies go into the next room and like after like five days being in that room I could see the mum and dad taking them home and they said to me um, like, down one morning and they said to me this is what's going in the next room and I was like Oh my god, I'd be able to take that home. And that was just that then. I, just, I could just, I felt like I could just let go of a bit of pressure because I knew that she got through the life threatening stage and now she was just, just poorly, poorly, not ridiculously life threatening poorly. So we went into that room and she got better and better. And then we came home and. Touch wood, my little Felicity, she just had a horrible rough start to life, but she has been fine ever since. And she's, yeah, she's a little bit tiny, but I'm small and my other little girl's small anyway. But yeah, she's extra dinky because she is premature and she did have a rough start in life, but there's no stopping that kid. I can tell you now, they said, look, she might be behind and things. No, 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 no way. There's no stopping that because she's a crazy ass girl, and I love her millions. And she's stronger than me because she showed me how strong a uh, five pound. And actually, when I bought her own, she lost weight. She was three pounds eleven. And people seem to think the smaller they are, the poorer they are. But that's not the case. Because when I bought her own, she weighed less, but she was poorer when she weighed more. But when I bought her own, she was three pounds eleven. It just goes to say she's an almighty fighter. You know, so yeah, but yes, she's all okay. Um, yes, it did happen again. Obviously, I was poorly. And I went through it all again with the breastfeeding. And I 
had my proctectomy, my barbie butt, and the abscess all removed. Um, it took eight hours. It took. It was an absolutely horrific operation. Um, but when I woke up and saw my bum, I was like, "That was so worth the eight hours and all this pain I'm in right now." Because it is like a masterpiece. Like my bum before was just all. Mm -hmm. You can imagine scraping out the abscess every two months for nine years, draining it, putting these straw seatons in place so the abscess could drain. My bum was just lifeless. And then after this operation of plastic surgery, they removed the horseshoe abscess. Um, they removed, the, they perhaps tracked back on the fistula, sorted that out. They um, did plastic surgery around where the abscess was and around my foot coping tubes. They did plastic surgery on it. On the inside of my bum, they removed a bit of bowel, up, screw, um, keyhole surgery as well. Um, and then they did a little bum lift. So my, uh, my surgeon, I'm so lucky, he is a colorectal surgeon and a plastic surgeon in private as well. So I am very, very lucky, I must admit, with that. Um, yeah, and I was just like, wow, I love my bum. I can't believe it. I was like, I just, I was like, oh, I'm so glad that. I'm now the weight because obviously I've got my two girls, but yeah, and, and ever since having my bum removed, there's hardly been any operations, hardly any, but I have had a few operations because, um, this doesn't happen to everyone, so I don't want to alarm people, but, um, about a year ago, my reproductive system, no, two years ago, fell into my bum. And yeah, so and a bit of my bowel fell down, but it's okay. They sorted mm -hmm. it all out. But since mm -hmm. I have my bum removed, my reproductive system has not been right. I definitely don't have to live in my more. My cervix is falling behind and is in my bum. My uterus is falling down and upside down. And it's caused me to have an early menopause at the age of 30 years old. And um, yeah, so, and I was not told that any of this, the reproduction stuff, could happen. And to be honest with you, I don't think they have enough patients like me with the severe Crohn's disease that I have to really know what's actually going on. And what, but I've been speaking to a few other ladies put on my Instagram and it's more common than I thought because they're like, have you, have you had trouble since your bum being removed? And I'm like, what do you mean? And they're like, um, my periods and um, this and, and my reproductive system and, and my cervix is falling. And I'm like, wow, I thought I was the only one, but actually, so I think me and a group of girls need to get together and we need a doctor to work. It's, uh, there's not enough after, there is enough aftercare on, no, there isn't enough aftercare on having a proctectomy. There isn't, there you go, I said it. There isn't. I think that's, that's a really important topic, especially, you know, if you look at the sample size of you um, and on your social media, like that's not, it's not a very big, like spectrum of society and for you to have met numerous people already that are having these issues and for them to reach out to you and just ask that question it surely suggests that it's a problem bigger than we realize yeah and i think the thing is all us girls we know about our crohn's i can talk openly about my crohn's i know about my pregnancies because that happened to me so i can talk openly about that what's i what i'm going through now I can't talk openly about because I don't really understand it myself. And um, I've spoken to a couple of gynaecologists who did my surgeries, and they said, look, if you needed more, I'm happy to deal with how I am now, but they said, if you wanted more access, you need to go to London. You need to, you know, there's more, you need to be looked into more and things like that. But I, at the moment, I'm just okay to just live with the complications that I have. But should I be? I don't know. 
Um, but yeah, it's just that's another whole story in itself. I don't really want to talk about it on social media because I don't have enough knowledge about it. And even the doctors and the surgeons at the hospital I go to don't have enough on it, and that's the reason why I don't have enough on it. They can't tell me much about it because they don't look at the ladies that have had their bum removed and not often, they don't often come across ladies that have had their bum removed, you know, so they don't really know from south, they're gynecologists, they don't get the cranes and the bum removals and barbie butts, they just get like the gynae part of it. I was offered a whole reconstructed vagina wall up in London, but the risk for that operation, it was more riskier, it was like a 50-50 operation, that once again, I don't want what, to... What was the risk in, in it? Was it the risk that you would have no vagina? Yeah, so there was or... the risk where, where they were talking like sexual risks. So, you know, like a lot of, there was a big risk. And I was like, right, I'm happy, me and my husband are happy where we are at the moment sexually. So if it was to get physically I couldn't, then then I would have to maybe then think about that operation but at this time i don't want that operation because it's too too many risks involved and i will have an operation if there's risks involved like most of the times i've had no choice 57 surgeries later but when it comes to something like this and i'm okay i'm getting by you know i'd rather just leave it alone there's this and also as well it, i would do a trial and error as well because it's not something done every day, you know. Yeah. So they would be experimenting on me. So yeah, it's very. And again, that's about. another. It's another downer, I suppose, uh, of the process. Because as much as we might be game occasionally, like we don't want to be pincushions all our life. No, no, definitely not. I was a, you know, like don't get me wrong. When they come in the room, they're like um, a student nurse who's, you know. A, sound a doctor wants to observe of course they've got to learn somehow and when i was younger when i was 12 years old i experimented a drug the anti-tns drug which everybody knows about now i experimented that in bristol i was the first child in bristol to have that drug put into my body because that's how poorly i was i was like you know give me anything this is before the bath so like don't get me wrong i am up for when it comes to needing it and having to have it, I will, but it's got to a point now where like, I'm not needing it, having it, but I would like a support network out, out there to just reassure me of what's going on in my body. Cause I don't know, I don't actually know. And you know, it's just recently I've been diagnosed with epilepsy and um, temporal lobe epilepsy. I had a diagnosis um, cause I was seizing at home and I was like, Christ's sake, like what now? And I was like, is this linked to Crohn's? And they're like, no. Then I had the EEG back, and it, they're like, well, yeah, technically it is, because we've worked out that your sepsis is called your temporal lobe epilepsy. I was sepsis, had sepsis in 2016, and they're like, you had organ da damage uh, that left neurological damage and hasn't been picked up on until now, being diagnosed with temporal lobe epilepsy. And still now, they're saying, yeah, it's the sepsis and the infection of my bum for nine years. But still now, is it is that really what's happened? Is there a little bit more to it? Like, I don't really know what's going on in my body anymore. I just really don't because my brain is so severe. I just really don't get it. I just, you know, but I am being medicated for my epilepsy and I do feel a bit better. So that is a good sign. So they have got the right diagnosis. But there was a part of me that thinks, what's going to happen tomorrow? What if I start seizing again? And they're like, well, actually, we think it was this and not that. There's a part of me that thinks, oh, are they missing something? But we all go through life thinking that, though, don't we, I suppose? I think you're, you're justified in that thought process. because it's, it's, it's one of those situations where, you know, ultimately they've just admitted that they don't know or they haven't known in the past and actually this is the best guess that we can make currently like based, based on your 
care pathway in your care history that you've just described. Yeah. I'm not, I think that's the unfortunate unknown or the unfortunate reality of, of modern medicine. That within, if you go if you go far enough, we don't know. We you know, and it, it's like I think it's a veil that exists in the modern day society that our healthcare systems and the stuff that we've invented makes us almost in a position where we're untouchable. And it's a very scary experience when you hit that point where you're at the limit of medical science yes. and a doctor is sat there and saying, I don't know. Yeah. That's he very said, scary. I can remember the words. He said, you're too complex now. And it was like, and he said, but then he also reassured me, but then Andrew said, I thought, I'm too complex. So what, what do I do now then? I do like I'm just like left in limbo like if I go to London and talk to people then are they gonna want to experiment on me or do I just this is just what I'm doing I'm just taking these days it comes at the moment uh I think you know I'm coping at the moment with my epilepsy and all my meds I think if anything else was to start happening then I'd have to shout and push harder and be like look the reproductive system thing the epilepsy thing what what, what next like why why what, what what you know but yeah it's, it's just i'm just gonna be me for now and just be me and see what happens but yeah like i said i've just got to take each day as it comes um but yeah it's hard being told that you're too complex it's not the greatest feeling but at the same time I am a rock star, so I will, I will get through this. Um, well, that's the truth. I know my body more than anybody else, so if I do get poorly, I will go to that hospital and I will fight for myself, you know. Yeah, and I think, you know, like, I, I, I don't think you have to earn the right to have time for yourself and be yourself, but, like, you definitely have earned the right to, to sit back and not fight for the sake of fighting on this and, you know, learn what what's going on what's happening just for yourself and if you need to you know london, london's not going anywhere no no i know that yeah i know <laughs> so like, we've talked we've talked a lot and like the premise has been for the show is is talking about women's health issues and how these things can affect women in particular with ibd and or having an ostomy and i think that your story on your pregnancy will help a lot of women that are tuned into this or at least there'll, there'll be an empathetic response for those that have gone before and had similar experiences um, yeah. but what what advice would you give to to women that are either experiencing issues with their ibd and they're you know on long-term medication or have an ostomy like i want to start trying children like what what's your what would your advice be to people in those situations okay so as long as you have a good team of doctors and surgeons behind you that say give you the go ahead to have a baby then i will say just go for it try not to worry let your bo bodily body naturally just go with it because your body will naturally just go with it our human bodies are incredible whether we've got an ostomy or not with an ostomy our body will adapt to pregnancy it's actually very beautiful what an ostomy does when you're pregnant so it's fine um but yeah just go for it if, if you've got the, the people around you and the surgeons are saying it's okay you can go for it go for it don't think i'm an it just do it and be positive and you know that you've always got the team around you that are going to be looking after you 24 7 so they're going to be there they're going to help you and look my first pregnancy was absolutely fine and i was looked after with my first pregnancy the same as my second pregnancy first pregnancy went smoothly absolutely fine second pregnancy didn't go smoothly but i had everybody there ready to do their job and my little girl is now four years old and at school and it's fine where 
you know, and I was scared for her, but she's okay because of the help and the guidance I have behind me. So what I will say is, if you want to get pregnant with an ostomy bag, and your doctors and surgeons give you the okay, go for it, and it more likely will be okay, and you'll be fine, and you'll be amazed at what your beautiful body can do for you. So it's okay. And I'm always here if you want to talk to me on Instagram. I am, my inbox is always open if you feel you can ask me anything. I will always keep it to myself. You can be personal with me. You can ask me. It doesn't, I will answer any question because I've been there. I've gone through that. So if I can help you in any way mm-hmm. possible, and just, just by you asking me one question and I answer that question back, I can make you feel 10 times, a million better just by answering the question. So always just ask. Please ask because it can always help. So I'm just here for you and, yeah, go for it if you want to get pregnant. So uh, important point based on that, where can people find you? They can find me on Instagram and I am at crones.mummy. And I'm always there. I might not always get back to you straight away because I've got a hectic, crazy life with kids. <laughs> but um, I am always there and I will always get back to you. And, yeah, I'm just always here for you guys. Um, ask, ask away anything you want to ask me. Well, we've got to the part of the show now that I, um, I've robbed off Lewis Howes, who's a, he's a business podcaster and does a lot of stuff about mindset and stuff like that. And he calls it the three truths. So it's in the future now, many years from now, it's your last day on earth. And everything you've ever done, created, has disappeared. Not your children, but like content creation. If you've ever written a book or anything like that, it's all disappeared. And you get to leave now three truths, aka three life lessons you'd want to leave for the world. What would your three truths be? Be real, stay positive, and always believe. Wow. As quick as that. That is that is someone who lives by that. That is someone who lives by that. They were my first things that came into my head and yeah, I guess yeah, that is yeah. I make that they 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 are really positive lessons, do you know what I mean? So, like, being real, I think, is probably more prevalent today than ever um, because, you know, as we well know, we live our best life on social media um, and, you know, when you look at people on there, they are always seem to be doing well, but behind that veil, is it the same? I think I heard a really, uh, thinking about that, I heard a really um, good quote was, never judge someone's outsides by your own insides. Oh yes, definitely. And that's that's one of the things obviously that we do quite a lot on social media because you only see the the external what they want to show, and you're judging it against your internal workings as a person because you know yourself more than somebody that sees from the outside. But yeah, I think they were beautiful. I'd just like to take a minute to um, appreciate you, Yvonne, for coming on the show and all the things that you have done and are doing within our community just being a voice of reason being a voice of action and advocacy um and yeah just and actually just even during the show you haven't stopped offering to help um and allowing people to contact you whenever and i, I think that's such an admirable trait it's such a to be of service as you are to your community is is really admirable and i think you know we could really do with more people like that in the world and how you are with your girls as well as as Crohn's mummy, um, you know that that story, a story. Learning the process that you've gone through, um, I think it just endears me more to to you as a person. But it's it's so humbling to see how you were able to survive with honour and just the mental strength that you possess is so impressive. Oh, and thank you. you for coming on. And I just like to say as well, without you, we wouldn't have all these videos and podcasts for the world to see. So actually, thank you for being you as well, because 
you know, we wouldn't have had this podcast today and this, you know, might well make so many people thinking about getting pregnant and being like, actually, I'm just going to do it, you know. It might, this will help so many people and without you, that wouldn't have happened. So thank you as well. Okay, guys, that brings us to the end of the show. Um, thank you so much for joining in. And um, There's been some amazing comments um, popping up and thank you so much for supporting Yvonne as she's shared some really intimate and beautiful moments of her life so far. Um, she's truly an inspiration within the IBD community and she doesn't, I don't think she realises how hard she actually works for us as as an advocate and just being that presence in social media. And as you can see, she's so selfless. It is unbelievable. So without further ado, guys, we're going to close the show now and we will catch you on the next one.